Matthew chapter 21. While you're turning there, I'm just going to pray. Jesus, open our ears to hear your voice, my God. Give us hearts to respond to you. Shine the light of your face and show us the things that need to be erased. In your precious name, I pray. Amen. Amen. All right, are you guys there? Because you got to see this. Matthew 21. Look at verse 5. I'm going to read, I'm going to read from the King James. Halfway through the, second, the, the fifth verse, part B, it says, Behold, thy king cometh meek. <laughs> All right, I want you to say this with me, okay? Say, Behold, Behold thy, king thy king cometh, cometh meek. meek. <clears throat> this word behold is a special notice. Behold, give special attention to this. What? How your king arrives. The nature of your king. The ruler of the kingdom that you are a part of comes on the scene with meekness and humility. This is our God, meek and gentle. He appears in this certain way. I want you to say this with me because I want to be engaged to really give this to you, okay? Say this with me. Say, my Jesus Jesus reveals himself. Reveals himself as meek. As meek. Okay, this is so important because any of you who've been around for a little while, you realize that there's other presentations of our Jesus. But there's one Jesus, and he is meek and humble. And it's very important for us to remember this. The text does not say, Behold, thy king cometh powerful. Behold, thy king cometh gifted. Behold, thy king cometh wise. It doesn't say any of these things. Is he these things? Absolutely, without a doubt. But the way that he chooses to show forth his power, the way he chooses to show forth his gifting, his wisdom, is this. He is humble. (laughs) He's incredibly upside down. He comes in a way that is hard for you to actually see him because he's other than what human nature thinks him to be. Sometimes he can be in your midst, even as John the Baptist stands up and then he goes, there's one in your midst whose sandals I'm not fit to tie. In other words, he's walking around amongst you and you don't even recognize him. That's his nature. And only those who are low enough can recognize his lowliness. Otherwise, you'll walk right past him. This understanding that the Jews had of what they thought God to be made Jesus Christ, the Son, the tabernacle of heaven, walk right past him and they couldn't even see it. Because they had a thought of what they assumed God is and God would be like. And so because of this, Jesus says, you can't even recognize your hour of visitation. He weeps looking down over Israel. Why? Because their pride has blinded their eyes. They can't see him in his humility. And this is why he weeps. You don't even understand my wisdom, my character, my ways. So I am here and you can't even see me. You're blind to me. So this really hit me that this is so important because meekness marks the arrival of Jesus Christ. And if you, I don't know, I don't even want to say if you, I'm going to say you are Jesus kind. You're born of this Christ. And your nature is this. When you arrive on the scene, 
Sometimes people will not recognize who you are. But that doesn't mean you're not gifted. It doesn't mean you don't have wisdom. It doesn't mean that you don't have the power of God backing you. It means that they're looking for a God that they've created that's contrary to the one that came. So be okay when you walk in a room and nobody recognizes who you are. Because when you realize that your likeness to Jesus will probably have you overlooked, then you can just be happy being God's. This is very important. So, our king is meek, and he comes meek. Turn over to Matthew 11. You guys, we've talked about this many times. I hope this is okay with you guys. I really feel it's important to talk about it. So, Matthew eleven twenty eight. And I've said this before, but you got to see it. Come to me, all ye who are weary and heavy laden. <laughs> what a Christ. <laughs> He's looking, he doesn't want even, he doesn't want the strong to come to him. He wants the weak and the weary because they recognize their need. And I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Remember this. This text right here is the only time. I want you to say this with me. Stay engaged with me. Say, this is the only time time that my Jesus Jesus tells me what he's like like from his own mouth. mouth. When we swallow that, then we realize the significance of these chosen words. The only time Jesus stands up to give a self-description he chooses these words. He, it's almost as if uh, he knew that there would be debate in the future as to what he was like. So he completely clears the air and says, it doesn't matter what people say. It doesn't matter what people think. I'm going to tell you what I'm like. Yes. And he says, I'm humble. And he encourages us to learn this way. I remember early Christian writers said, learn humility because you cannot fight Satan with Satan. So, of these attributes that Jesus could have described himself, he describes himself as humble. Jesus forever settles this, what his image is. So he knew that they'd uh, one day look back. He knew we'd one day look back and say, I want to know what my Jesus is like. And he made it crystal clear for you. He's humble. Let me, just, let me just put it in here a little bit further. If we lack humility, we lack Christ-likeness. It, you can pull up people out of wheelchairs and raise the dead. If you lack humility, you still don't look like Jesus. If you lack humility, you missed his whole nature, wisdom, and character. It's what he described himself as. It's because of the greatness of his power and his majesty, it's easy to have the human mind create something that they think him to be and walk right past him, as, as I said a minute ago. So above all other things, God means to make men humble. That's what he wants to do. James chapter 4, verse 6, we realize that grace flows into the humble. Grace how many of you need grace? Yeah. Now, you guys, you guys know that grace is, a, is, a, is like a two-fold word, like the word in English, hard. A yeah. test can be hard, yeah. and a rock can be hard. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Grace is the same way. It's unmerited favor and unlimited power. Yeah. So you have both of these things working. Paul says, I worked harder than all of them, not me, the grace of God in me. In other words, a supernatural enablement on the inside. But yet you're saved by grace, the unmerited favor of God. So we have... We, we have need of grace in our lives because it's our empowerment. It's our life supply. It's the gas in the tank. Yeah. And that gas in the tank only flows in in one way, and it is humility. Yes. Wow. Come on. You will recognize. I've, guys, I've recognized this in my life so many different times. 
But grace begins to wane in my life when I remove myself from humility. When I entertain high thoughts of myself, it's harder to, over, to overcome sin. When I entertain high thoughts of my own ministry or who I am or I'm relevant or I'm significant or I'm unique, when I start, when I start thinking of things like this in my own mind, I realize my own desire for God begins to wane away. It's because grace is drained by pride. But, but with humility, grace flows in. It flows in. I've told you, old man, what is good and what the Lord desires of you, that you would walk humbly with your God. In other words, without humility, there's no step, step in step with God. There's no walking with God without humility. It's humility that causes us to live in sync with God. How many of you have ever felt you got out of sync with the Lord? I've, many times in my life, I just can feel it. I'm out of sync with God. Where is the problem? Pride. Yeah, pride. <laughs> I was with Vanjie Vandenberg uh, not that long ago. Has she spoken to you guys here? Uh, she, she's incredible, Peter's wife. And she said that the Lord took her into the, the woods in a, in a vision. And while she was there, she felt so comfortable. Then the lights got a little bit brighter, and she saw an armed soldier standing next to her. And she couldn't see him when the light was, was a little darker, but when the light got a little brighter, she could see danger. And the Lord spoke to her and said, this is how pride is. It's always there. And the brighter the light of his presence gets in your life, the more you can see it in yourself. Yeah. And, and it's, a, it's a danger. So pride drains us of grace. It blinds us to his face. It withers men into snakes. It's flight from God's help. It's the custodian of hell, the fortress of lust. It threw angels into dust. It's the devil's cusp, Lucifer's invention, and God's only prevention. Pride will destroy us. Pride drains grace, guys. In Ezekiel chapter 28, I want to show you something that really hit me the other day. Uh, turn over to Ezekiel 28. Now this is that portion of Scripture that is thought to be God rebuking the devil and the, as the king of Tyre. Do you guys know what I'm talking about yeah. when I say this? So it says here, for, look at 14. You were the anointed cherub who covers. I placed you there. You were on the mountain of God. You walked in the midst of the stones of fire. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created until unrighteousness was found in you. By the abundance of your trade, you were internally filled with violence and you sinned. Therefore, I have cast you as profane from the mountain of God and I have destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom by reason of your splendor. Are you seeing this? This, in its most basic understanding, is his attention got off of God and onto himself. Because of it, was he beautiful? Yes. Who made him beautiful? God made him beautiful. But he took what God gave him and put it in front of God. Are you seeing it? This shows me something, that pride is so insidious it can freeze your heart even while you walk on the stones of fire. It, it hit me so hard that the snake of pride slithers even if you live in Eden. <laughs> in other words, you can live in the midst of the pleasures of God. Don't forget that there still can be a slithering snake that whispers something in your ear and robs you of the garden. You follow me? Pride is so insidious. Even living in Eden doesn't exempt you from its voice. Are you following me? Yeah. I just feel this is so important. Oh, Jesus. So in Isaiah, actually in, in Proverbs 8, verse 13, we see the fear of the Lord is this, to hate pride, arrogance in every evil way. So there needs to be hatred in our hearts. 
for pride, a hatred so much for it that we abhor it in ourselves. Oh, just put your hand on your heart. Say this with me. Say, Jesus, Jesus. give me a new hatred for pride in my life, for arrogance in my tone, in the way that I deal with people, in the way that I see myself. Deliver me from these things. Guys, in Isaiah 2.17, 2.12, 23.9, we see that God reckons every, re- reconciles everything to himself. And the catch-all of his reconciliation of all things to himself is he brings the proud low. What's so significant about that? Well, it shows to me that God's root issue with humanity is pride. Springing forth from pride is every evil thing. Notice the origin of evil itself is having eclipsed God with a sight of yourself. You guys are going to see multitudes come to Jesus. You guys are going to see the dead raised, the blind see, the lame walk. Many of you have already seen it, but you're going to see it more now than ever. Not just because you've been a part of the boot camp, but because God in this season is propelling you out to bring the kingdom to the world. Break the kingdom of God into the world. You're going to do this. And I'm telling you this, high praises may come. But if you listen to those high praises, they'll take you high. Bob Gladstone told us, when people praise you, don't love it, don't hate it, just forget it. John Kilpatrick said to us, you're never as bad as they say you are, and you're never as good as they say you are. You're just somewhere in between. So pride provokes God. We see it. It makes man his enemy. I don't want to be God's enemy, especially if I'm purporting to be in his service, yet operating contrary to his nature. I tell you, if there's anything more frustrating to God, it is those who claim his name and don't have his nature. And by faith, they operate in power. But without surrender, they don't have his nature. So selfishness, oh man, there is, n- there is nothing as opposed to God as self-centeredness, self-sufficiency, self-effort, self-exaltation, self-consciousness. Nothing is as opposed to God as these things. Vance Havner once wrote, if Jesus didn't come to save us from self-infatuation, I don't know what he came to save us from. One of the reasons Jesus was sent, as Andrew Murray said, was to bring humility back to the earth. Matthew 20, Jesus talks about the fact that he's going to die. Then the sons of Zebedee's mother come and say, let my son sit on the sides of you. Remember this? You know what Jesus says? Jesus follows this by speaking to them about giving up himself for others. The gospel always gives life to the hearer and death to the giver, Jackie Pullinger said. And so it is when we, in our hearts, lay ourselves down. This is the expression of the world that we're preaching to people the kingdom that we're preaching to people, the God that we're preaching to people. You remember when Jesus is on the cross, there's an accusation that comes against him. It says he saved others, but he cannot save himself. You remember this? They uttered the very wisdom of God and didn't even realize it. That's how hidden God's wisdom is. It can come out of your mouth and you don't even know that you just said it. He, if he saved others, he cannot save himself. That's the rule of God. If you're going to save other people, you can't save you. This is the essence of humility. Humility is I'm not saving myself so that I might save others. It's it's the loss of self. And so in James 4.10, we see humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord. I want you to notice that there's, there's a link between the presence of God and humbling yourself. A link. They're inseparable. They're dependent on one another. 
the difference between humility and humbling yourself are very important to understand. Here's the difference. Humility is the character and nature of Christ given to you. But humbling yourself is bowing down in the honest offering of all to God. You can humble yourself by throwing everything down to his feet. But when, he, when you throw everything down to his feet, he lifts you into Christ's humility. I remember Andrew Murray said, let us flee to Christ until we are clothed with humility. Keep, we keep fleeing to Christ. So when you, I've told you guys this before, but if you fill up a, a glass of water, the water rushes into the bottom of the glass, right? It's the first place that gets filled is the lowest place. And so it is with those who live underneath the influence, satisfied, and drinking constantly of the Spirit. Those that are low are the ones who get access to the water. Those that are high, they become dry really quickly. So, Isaiah 57, 15. You guys know this verse that our God, He dwells in a high and holy place and also with the lowly, the contrite in heart. God has a dualistic dwelling, a simultaneous dwelling in the highest place in the heavens and in the lowest hearts on the earth. This is how He is. He loves this. He's, it wins His heart. God will pass over a million gifted men to get to one humble man. God only stays in a humble residence. This is how he is. Andrew Murray said, without humbling ourselves, there can be no true abiding in God's presence or experience of his favor. I'm amazed, guys, at how little humility is thought of or even talked about. When it's so important in the scriptures. It's the, it's the root of the childlikeness we've been talking about. As I told you before, Andrew Murray said, the true beauty of childlikeness is the absence of self-consciousness. That's humility. Why is it so important? Well, it's the one indispensable condition of fellowship with Jesus and the presence of the Spirit. Humility is so important. How important is the presence of God to you? Well, humility should be as, as important because it's the only way to it. Humbling ourselves, as we've done here for months now. We come in with exclusive attention. We come to worship. We come to bow down. We come to kneel before the Lord our God, our maker. It's choosing to humble ourselves that he might fill us as we're low and bring us into or share with us the wonderful nature of his own son. Praise God. So to God, a lowly heart is the chief mark of those that are following the lowly lamb. Let us be impressed, guys, with what impresses God. I, I'm so grateful for power. We need it to do the work. But nothing wins my heart when, as when I see somebody who's willing to be forgotten, someone who's okay with not being recognized, someone who doesn't even have a, a desire to try to make themselves relevant or significant or stand out. They just... They, if God has made me his prophet, then let him show it. What, do I, what am I going to do? You know what I'm saying? You, co you come into a room and you are dependent upon your God to put you wherever he wishes you to be, whether it's in the hand or in the shelf. Amen. I give you myself. So in my earlier days, when I first got born again, I wanted to, to glow. <laughs> I literally wanted to have my shadow heal the sick. This, this was my, my goal. I wanted to have demons ma manifest just at the sound of my voice. I wanted to be the godlike one in our midst. That was, that was my desire. But as I'm getting older, I'm not looking to glow for a show so that people know I want to stay low. <laughs> this is what's important. I want to crave one thing in, in my life. I want, to, I want to bring my heart to the feet of Jesus and have him bring me into likeness of, him, of himself. Isn't that the most important thing? If Jesus is humble, then the image of Jesus that God has called us to is a humble life. If Jesus is humble and is only self-description, then what God is looking for on that great day of judgment is whether you are low or not. Is your heart low? Last year, my wife asked me, what do you want for your birthday? 
And I, I searched my heart for like, what's the, the thing that I want the most in life? And it just, just rose up on, on the inside of me, a craving, and my eyes welled with tears. And I looked at her and I said, how much is a humble heart? This is what I want above all things, Lord. Make me lowly. As Ian Bounds said, make me humble and unknown, prized by God and God alone. This is the key. This is our Christ, lowly and meek. meek. Satan breathed pride into Adam to spring forth a whole humanity that is full of themselves. And Dan Kalinda told me one time, God will send no one home empty except those who are full of themselves. Yes. No room for God. Most people live their lives like this. Andrew Murray said, humility is the displacement of self and the enthronement of God. We, live, we must live this way. Humility is not a virtue among other virtues. It's the root of all virtues. Curé D.R. is an early Christian writer. He said, without humility, man only has the appearance of virtues. It only looks like he has virtues without humility. Our ministries can quickly become quests for honor. Our ministries can quickly become quests to build a legacy about ourselves. And humbling ourselves is the only right attitude towards God and before God. To say, whatever you wish me to have, Lord. It puts God where he's supposed to be, and it puts us where we're supposed to be. Humbling ourselves alone allows God to do everything for us and through us. This is what I want. Is this what you want? Yes. So, God has never been pleased with man's efforts, as, as you know. But what does it look like to be humble in, in everything we see Jesus, and Jesus is perfection of humility. He is humility to its ultimate. Andrew Murray said, humbling ourselves is nothing less than man's complete consent to actually let God do everything. We see Jesus say in John 5, 19, the son can do nothing of himself. In John 5, 30, I can do nothing. And John 7, 16, even these words are not mine. John 8, 28, I do nothing on my own. John 8, 50, I don't seek my own glory. Jesus is showing us inside of himself an absolute bankruptcy. I can do nothing, and I choose to do nothing. Even the words that I speak to you, I don't even have an ownership over them. Yeah. I remember a, a friend of mine was taking uh, statements, this was about five years ago, a friend of mine was taking statements that I got from the Lord and speaking them as his own. And it started to bother me. And I went into my closet and I was just like, Lord, it's bothering me so much. It's bothering me. So you spoke those things to me and he's speaking them out as if you gave them to him. And I'm going back and forth with all this, <laughs> this, this, this back and forth, prideful cry out to God. And I knew 717, I turned to John 717 and, and Jesus says that the words that I speak are not my own. The Lord spoke to me clear as day. And then he says, why do you think these words have their origin in you? It hit me like a ton of bricks. And I said, from then on, I made a decision in my heart. Nothing that I give is mine. Because it was given to me. And I asked the Lord to sever me from being connected to, even emotionally connected to, being remembered as someone who said something. I want it I wanted to just go to the point now where I will encourage people, preach it as your own, because it's not mine. It was given, and I give it, and so that you can give it, so someone else can give it. It all belongs to him. Yes. Jesus teaches us the most spiritual life is one of absolute self-renunciation and reliance upon God. That's what he's showing us. Art Katz said, Jesus divorced himself from any fulfillment or gratification independent of his father. Jesus divorced himself from any fulfillment or gratification independent of his father. I fear that more often than not, our striving is a restless eagerness to obtain spiritual things by ourselves. Maybe what we esteem as fire is just the dead end of tiresome religious zeal. Sometimes it's just how it comes off. People are frustrated with the fact that they're not able to make anything happen. So they're trying to make something happen. It just looks like fire. <laughs> fire is not fervency. It's no vacancy. Yes. <laughs> so 
Many times we enter into a frenzied attempt to mask the fact that we don't really believe that in the person of the Holy Spirit sent to perform all things through us in a humble vessel. We don't actually believe this. And so we have a frenzied attempt to try to make something happen. It's just an evidence of pride. It's a restlessness set in motion by a self-centeredness and self-confidence. But pride itself will be destroyed when a man goes low enough to realize only you can do these things and only you are able to do them. This is why men are struggling to make themselves holy or increase in gifts and power by their own efforts. I taught at Bethel last night via uh, Skype and I was trying to tell them we don't discipline ourselves to get the Spirit. We by faith receive the Spirit and the Spirit gives us discipline. It's a totally different, it's a totally different ball game. So, um, self can never cast out self. But only if a man relinquishes all things to God can God actually be all through a man. To humble ourselves means we believe in the power of the Spirit. I want you to say this with me. Say, to humble myself myself means means I I believe. And trust trust in the power of the Spirit. Spirit. Guys, this is the dependency that will enable Christ's humility on the inside of us. There's a story of a a young Catholic girl. I might have told you this, but it fits perfectly right here. Young Catholic girl's looking up at the stained glass windows. Did I tell you this? And she's looking up at the stained glass windows in Sunday school. And the Sunday school teacher says to the kids in class, how many of you know what a saint is? The little girl's looking up at the stained glass window of St. Francis with a bird on his shoulder or something. And all the kids are like, uh, you know, I don't know. Finally, the little girl raises her hand and the teacher says, yes, do you know, you know what a saint is? She goes, yes. And she looks up at the stained glass window of St. Francis and she goes, they're the ones that the sun shines through. And that's the essence of humility. It makes you transparent so God can come through you in your own color. God can come through you in your own face. Humility. It's the key. Many people see wonderful and delightful things in the scriptures. Joy unspeakable. Peace that passes all understanding. Victory over sin. Freedom from comparison. Liberty from condemnation. Blissful fellowship and abiding in the presence of the Lord. They look at all these things and they're like, that's a reality in the scriptures. And it's just like a little boy who comes to a candy shop and he's on the outside of the candy store and he's looking at all the goodies behind the glass. And the owner of the shop comes out and he says to the little boy, he says, go ahead, take whatever you want. And the little boy looks at the candy behind the glass and goes, I can't. There's a thick pane of glass between me and and the candy. All I can do is see what I want. I can't apprehend it. And this is how most people read the Bible. All of these wonderful things promised to me. Joy, unspeakable, peace that passes all understanding. It's right there. I can see it. But because of pride, there's a thick pane of glass between them and apprehending the things that God has given to them. C.S. Lewis said, proud people are always looking down on others and things. And of course, if you're always looking down, you cannot see him who is above all. Andrew Murray said, the, the insignificances of daily life are the importances and tests of eternity because they prove what spirit, spirit really possesses us. Let me read it one more time. This is incredible. The insignificances of daily life are the importances and tests of eternity because they prove what spirit really possesses us. See, pride manifests itself in touchiness, harshness, impatience, control, irritations, judgment, cynicalness, competition, comparison, jealousy, bitterness. These are all evidences of an exalted self. These are things that are evidences of the neglect of God. Nothing is so imperfect as being impatient with the imperfections of others. He said, Eric, but now you're talking about dealing with people. Yes, because humility goes into every fiber of your being. Yes, it makes you the house of God, and it also makes you to be an expression of God to others. It's, it's the key, man. Without this, we, we miss it. I don't know anyone who would look at God and say, I don't need you anymore. But when we walk in pride, that's exactly what we testify to him. I don't know anyone who would say, who, who, I mean, I just don't need God. I got this. 
But by not coming to him and laying everything down, that's what we've professed to him. This is why coming to God in the mornings like this is so important. It's because it's your declaration of the fact that you're bankrupt and empty and you deeply need him. And to skip these things as if they're kind of secondary or not very important, it is to testify with your life. I don't need you. I've got enough of you to get through. I got enough gas in my tank. See, we slip into an... We slip into these things unconsciously even. We, they creep in undetected many times. As the pride that feels satisfied with its own attainment. <laughs> pride gets satisfied with its own attainment. Um, pride notices how far advanced it is next to others. I haven't done that. You see what I'm saying? I'm trying to really nail it down because I want to ask the Lord to make us humble people today fresh. I, I want to choose humility afresh today. Yeah. You recognize somebody struggling with something that you're not and, a, and, a, and a, a rise of pride comes in. You say, I'm not doing that. Pride will cause you to immediately measure yourself measuring yourself with other people is probably the most undetected form of self-exaltation that there is. And it's everywhere in the midst of the body. And it robs joy. You guys have heard that famous quote, comparison is the thief of joy. Yes. I, would say, I would say that, that comparison and competition, they're assassins of your enjoyment of God. You invite them in when you let those thoughts into your, to your mind because you've moved away from, pride, uh, from humility. We must take caution in professing to others the extent of our religious restrictions and our restraints. Sometimes we present ourselves before others with a resume of what we are and what we've done. This is pride. You say, Eric, but this isn't like looking at pornography. No, it's, it's just as damned as pornography. It's the same root. It's the same source. It's the same contrariety. It's, it's wrong. It's against God. God hates this. Yeah. And sometimes we build up a relevance for ourselves in the minds of others by what we tell them about ourselves. Listen, there's no need for any of this. And I'm saying this to spare you. Do yourself a favor and burn your resume. Yeah. Because when, when you take your resume out of your own mouth to build up a relevance for yourself in the mind of someone else, you begin to lack grace yes. in your life. And then it affects your enjoyment of God. It, it literally spreads through and unbelief starts to set in. Because you begin to rise higher and higher. And by reason of your own beauty, by reason of your own beauty, even if you walk on the stones of fire, your heart is frozen with pride. So, even sharing our testimony sometimes can shift from glorifying God to indirectly building up a reverence in the minds of others for ourselves. Yeah, <laughs> You're not going to be this way, guys. You're not going to do this. You will, share, you will share your testimonies to the glory of one great name. Yeah. That there is only one who can do these things. And you will tell the whole crowd, even as you've seen Daniel do many times, Who did this for you? <laughs> And then they say, Jesus, there's one person who gets all the glory. Amen. He will not share his glory with another. Amen. Praise God. Yes. I remember Bunky. I was riding in the car with Bunky and I had saw a video of them crying out Bunky's name. Bunky, Bunky. And I looked at him and I said, how do you deal with that? You know, how do you deal with that? <laughs> They're saying your name. Then he goes, I know what they really mean. They mean Jesus. Yeah. Bunky's God. And I thought that was beautiful. I thought it was beautiful. So even what we've given up, sometimes we, sometimes we, we focus on what we've given up and tell everybody what we've given up. We, off, we, like, off, we like to offer up Isaac in public. Everybody, I'm going to be sacrificing Isaac. Come on up. Come on out tomorrow night. I'll be sacrificing Isaac. <laughs> Nobody went up the mountain with Abraham. As a matter of fact, he told everybody to stay there because it was a private issue between him and God. Sometimes we 
exalt even the private issues in front of people in order to build up something about ourselves. I'm just like Abraham. Look at me, sacrificing Isaac. Are you following me? I'm just trying to knock some stuff off you so you can enjoy God to the fullest. I'm, I'm trying to... I'm, I'm trying to... I'm trying to unpack some of these things you didn't even know you were carrying so that you can be even more free to preach the gospel with joy. Amen. And you're not even concerned about what's happening with other people. And when you hear about it, you can only rejoice because there's nothing left in there. There's no buttons to press because they're gone. Praise God. Yeah. A pride whose counsel and teaching seeks to call people to themselves. A pride of presenting ourselves as the standard. This is just... You know, Paul says we do not preach ourselves, but Christ. Sometimes we will use our, ourselves as the example, and indirectly we're setting people up to look at us instead of Jesus Christ. John Murray, Andrew Murray's brother, they were sharing letters with each other, and I read this in Andrew Murray's biography. He wrote to his brother, and he goes, I still find it so hard not to preach myself. So honest and real that he could actually admit that. He's like, I keep finding, I slip into preaching myself. And this is the essence of what God is delivering us from. We will not preach ourselves. We will preach Jesus Christ and Jesus, Jesus alone. So let us beware of high thoughts or high feelings of ourselves or our own disciplines or taking notice of our advancement beyond others because this self-glory robs every virtue of its value before God. Robs every virtue of its value before God. Humility is has given up all thought of itself in the presence of God. There's, there's one that is here that's so worthy of attention. To give attention to myself is an abomination. Yeah. That's how glorious he is. Yeah. Yeah. So we are, as Andrew Murray said, we are never more humble than when we adore Jesus. So you say, Eric, but I just, I don't know if I can like find all these roots of pride in my life and just keep a tabs on them and then like set a list. Did I exalt myself? Did I, do, you know, forget it. Just adore Jesus and you'll be fine. Yeah. Because in adoring and loving and honoring and putting Jesus where he belongs, the sight of his brightness will blind you to everything else. Yeah. It's like when the smoke fills the temple. <laughs> the, so, the smoke fills the temple. That's the manifest presence of God. When the smoke of God fills your temple, you can't see anything else but the smoke. Yeah. In other words, God gets all the attention. You can't even see the instruments or the other priests that are there. All you can see is the smoke. That's the essence of worshiping God and being filled with His presence so that He's the only thing that gets all the attention. You no longer compare yourself with others because you've lost yourself in finding Him. Wow. Comparing, comparing myself with others means that I do not find all I need in Jesus. Oh. Yes. Comparing myself with others means I don't find all that I need in Christ Himself. Are you following me? This is so important, guys, and I told you I want to just give you, this is my last time talking to you, so I'm going a little long. I, I, I hope it's okay. Is it okay? His presence, as you've realized in here and in your own personal time, His presence frees you from the need to have anything else. That's what makes everything so simple and so easy. This is the burden that is light and the yoke that is easy. Is that the right way? Yeah. You are freed from that heavy weight of needing other things in his presence. I, have, I need nothing, not the praise of man, not relevance, not significance, just you and you alone. It doesn't even, as I said, recognize being forgotten because it's not even part of, of the equation anymore. <laughs> when self is not a part of the equation, you don't even recognize being forgotten. I told you already, God will smile on one humble man over a million gifted men. Yeah. See, you can be a channel of blessing for multitudes and still in the daily dealings of home, -like, home life lack the tenderness of Jesus. Isn't it true? Yeah. How many of you have ever ministered greatly? And then when you come home, or your roommate or your spouse or something, and all of a sudden you're just like a firecracker. Yeah. It's because at some point you misconstrued what you are you thought yourself to be something great look where I just came from <laughs> but
But if you remember that what you are is nothing and he's everything, then you, there's, no fire to, there's no firecracker to light. Yeah. Because on the stage or in the house, your place is still the same beneath him. The lowest are nearest to God. Praise God. The humility which characterizes the real abiding of, uh, in Christ. It is the very image of God in a man. St. Augustine said, nothing keeps a man outside of the reach of the devil as humility. Wow. There's, a, there's a story of, of an old saint, and he's praying in prayer, and he goes into a vision. He sees the entire world, and there's traps everywhere. It traps, as far as the eye can see, he sees traps in the world. And he looks at the Lord in prayer in this vision. He says, Lord, how am I to make it through the world without being harmed by these traps that are everywhere? And a voice came from behind him and said, humility. So he felt like there's traps with men, traps in life, traps in your own mind, traps set up by the world. There's traps everywhere that are trying to capture you in pride. But humility, you'll be able to get right through them. And you won't be caught in these traps of, of strange strife between two, two peoples, two strife between groups. All these things are, are they're not even, you slip right past them. Yeah, come on. It's as if they disappear. So humility is what it's all about. Jesus is the most humble, right? You say, how can I prefer someone above myself when I'm, I know I'm far greater or smarter than that person? Uh, Have you had this before? Yeah. <laughs> I'm older than them. Yeah. I'm more successful than them. I have more money than they do. Yeah. I'm far more graced than them. I know I'm more gifted than them. How do, you, how, do you, how do you prefer someone above yourself when you know these things are true? Jesus, in Luke 22, he says... I am among you as him who serves. Amen. Jesus is far more gifted than everyone around him. He's far wiser. He's far older. He's got way more money. <laughs> and he comes as one to serve those that are so far inferior to him. Praise God for a Christ like this. Matthew 23, 11, Jesus says that the servant is the greatest of all, the slave. Jesus is not saying that if you pay your dues serving, then you'll one day be lifted to a place where people serve you. That's not what he's saying. He's saying service is the highest place. Praise God. What does this mean? Am I calling all of us just to like line up and serve in the nursery? Is that what, is that what I'm trying to do? No. It's humbling ourselves that causes the nature of Christ to come through us. A heart preferring others above ourselves. Consider others better than ourselves. And loving everyone around us. I'm going to end right here, but Jesus says in Philippians 2, well, Paul says of Jesus in Philippians 2, having this mind in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Though he was God Almighty, he emptied himself. His heart affections, his motives, his intentions, his expectations, family, possessions, calling, gifting, past, present, future, before God, and uh, emptying everything down. This is the humility that we're looking at and that we practice when we come to him. Jesus, even while being persecuted, continued to commit himself to God. With each blow that hit upon his face and even every plucking of his beard was an attempt to get him to act independent of his father. Yeah. So the scripture says he kept committing himself to God. A blow upon his face. He wants to react. I commit myself to you, Lord. Another pull of the beard. Lord, I commit myself to you. I'm not going to act on my own behalf. I'm going to commit myself to you. Maybe soon you will start doing what you're doing or continue doing what you were doing. And someone will come, a ministry will come, and will betray you. This is when you get your beard plucked and you say, I commit myself to you, Lord. And then you can pray for those who just plucked your beard. The highest form of Christ-likeness is when you're bleeding and suffocating to death on a cross. And you say, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. They don't even know what they're doing. Praise God. So... 
I'm going to end right here with a poem. Just close your eyes. I want to I wanna read this poem over you. I want you to listen to every word. As a matter of fact, just say it with me. Say this. Say humility. humility. Thy, endless Thy endless work in me. Every pruning of your knife. Every pruning of your knife. Cuts, the Cuts the growing pride of life. Confusion, hurt, worry, and care. Confusion, hurt, worry, and care. Humility would have greatly spared. If you will take me once again, remove pride's poison from within. I humble myself and bow to thee. Teach me, Lord, humility to have a mind like unto thee. Humble Savior, humble me. 